All right, guys, so there is a carnivore diet advocate who is a PhD who just released a video titled 13, 13 nutrients that are missing or deficient on a vegan diet long version. Now, a couple things before we begin. This is a person who has their PhD who doesn't read their sources properly or at the very least reads them but doesn't understand them. I say this because she recently covered a randomized control trial that was comprised of primarily plant-based diets, and she referred to the study as a carnivore randomized control trial in the title of her video. Here's a clip from Nutrivore or Nick Hybert or Hebert, I'm not really sure how you pronounce his last name, who you all should definitely follow, covering her lack of an ability to understand and read studies that she cites in depth. Another 2021 carnivore diet study provides additional evidence for the superiority of an animal. It was not a carnivore diet study. All three diets in the study were plant-based. One group ate 70% animal protein and 30% plant protein. Another was 50-50 animal and plant protein. And the last group ate 70% <laughs> plant protein and 30%. I think what she thinks this means is that one like one group in the study had 70% animal foods and 30% plant foods and the plant-based diet was 70% plants and 30% animal foods. If that's what she believes, she's out to fucking lunch and she didn't read the study. If you actually open it up and go down to the distribution of energy from protein, for the plant-based group, it was 15.2% of energy from protein, 50-50 was 16.9 animal uh, the animal group was 18.2. So what this is, is it's a substitution of protein calories. So 70% of 18.2% of energy was coming from animal foods, right? Or animal protein. That's the substitution that was being made. This was not a 70% animal food diet versus a 70% plant food diet. It was nothing like that. All three of these diets were plant-based. The results showed that replacing the animal protein with plant protein led to a reduction in the intake and status of vitamin B12 and iodine to increase- Okay, buddy. If you're going to say that a reduction actually occurred, you need more than just final scores. If you actually crack open their supplement, they don't have change scores for urinary iodine. They only have final scores, which cannot be interpreted the way she's interpreting them. She's saying there was a reduction. How do you know that if baseline status was not ascertained? I strongly recommend you all watch Nick's full covering of her covering of the paper, but just know that her response to all of these critiques from Nick after everything he says in his video, which is a lot, like really, please go watch his debunk after this. But after everything he says, that's all she has to say. So this is the kind of person we're working with here. So again, go subscribe to Nick. And without further ado, let's look at the 13, 13 nutrients that are missing or you might become deficient in when consuming a vegan diet. This video is a cautionary tale for anyone wanting to get healthier and who's thinking that a vegan diet is a good start. It's not. Not only because it is the complete opposite of what our species ate for over 99.99% .99 of its existence here on Earth. So we have a PhD here already trying to make the point that one of the reasons we shouldn't be consuming a vegan diet is because it is not reflective of what humans have been eating for 99.9% .9 of our history. Even if this is the case, who cares? What determines health outcomes is not what we consumed in the past, but health outcomes. So. When it comes to evaluating whether or not a diet is healthy or a lifestyle is healthy, we need to look at actual outcomes. It doesn't matter if the diets weren't done in the past. For example, for most of our history, we were not taking B12 supplements, but we know through health outcome data that they work. You would think that a PhD would understand this concept, but I guess not. Number one, taurine. Taurine is an amino acid that is only found in animal foods. It is an antioxidant and powerful anti-inflammatory that can lower your risk of heart disease, our number one cause of death globally. It also works to lower blood pressure levels. While our bodies do create some taurine, researchers believe that taurine should also come from the diet as our ability to make enough of it is impaired when we are stressed. That means if you increase the intensity of your workouts or you're working on multiple projects at the same time, all these things indicate an increase in stress, which means you need more taurine from your diet. That is why scientists studying taurine insist on treating taurine as an essential amino acid that must come from the diet. 
Unfortunately, vegetarians have less than half the amount of taurine in their urine compared to omnivores, which makes sense since you can only get taurine from animal foods. While it is true that vegans are likely to have lower plasma taurine levels than our non-vegan omnivorous counterparts, as indicated by these two papers, we still do not have strong outcome-based evidence for an optimal level of taurine, so it isn't really clear whether vegans should be worried about lower levels of taurine. And if we take a look at one of the papers she cited, it says, furthermore, double-blind long-term clinical trials are required before the implementation of taurine as a new nutritional intervention for patients at risk of taurine deficiency and cardiovascular disease. Regardless, if strong data came out suggesting that vegans should be having high levels of taurine and that taurine supplementation is recommended, then I would just say, vegans, go ahead and supplement taurine just like we do with B12. Not really an issue. And yes, taurine supplements exist. So if you're really worried about your taurine levels, go ahead and take a vegan taurine supplement. But the data does not suggest at the moment that it's really necessary. Number two, creatine. Creatine is not only important for putting on muscle, it's actually quite an important molecule for brain function. Watch this video to learn more about the importance of creatine and dosage requirements. I will also link it along with all other videos that I mentioned in the description box below. Also know that vegans and vegetarians have been shown to have less creatine than their omnivore or meat-eating counterparts. So she doesn't really provide any sources for her creatine claims. However, creatine is something that I've recommended athletes take if they possess the goal of optimizing strength, muscle, and athletic performance. Let it be known that creatine is something widely taken by non-vegan athletes already. I, for one, was taking creatine as a meat eater and still do today as a vegan, and it was purely for athletic reasons. One of the main reasons that meat eaters who possess athletic goals are still recommended to take creatine is because during the process of cooking animal foods comprised of creatine, a large portion of creatine is converted into creatinine. Whether vegans who aren't athletes should be supplementing creatine is not totally clear at the moment, but there is some data suggesting creatine monohydrate supplementation can result in cognitive benefits. Similar to the taurine case, if it were discovered that vegans, athlete or not, could benefit from creatine supplementation, I would recommend they participate in it. Number three, carnosine. Carnosine is the fountain of youth. It literally undoes the damage that carbs and sugar do to your body. And guess where carnosine is found? You guessed it, animal foods. While it is true the body can make some carnosine, vegans and vegetarians always have lower levels of carnosine in their blood. So just like the creatine part, she did not provide any sources to back up her carnosine claims. But yes, it is true that our bodies synthesize our own carnosine, and this paper showed changing to a vegetarian diet reduces the body creatine pool in omnivorous women, but appears not to affect carnitine and carnosine homeostasis. This only further reinforces the point that vegans do not need to worry about carnosine. The muscle half-life of carnosine in humans is not fully known, and it would be nice to know this to, you know, really understand why in these vegetarian women their carnosine levels didn't go down. But for whatever it's worth, it is about 28 days in rats. Probably not worth much to know. Number four, cholesterol. Your liver can only supply up to 75% of your cholesterol needs. The rest has to come from the diet. Cholesterol is only found in animal foods like egg yolks, organ meats, and seafood. Unfortunately, if you are mainly plant-based, you will not have enough cholesterol to optimize for hormone production. You won't have optimal levels of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHA, or even vitamin D. Okay, so she provides no sources for her cholesterol claims. What's new? But yes, it is true that cholesterol can be synthesized by each cell in the body and therefore we do not need to consume it from plants. If she believes that the degree to which humans can synthesize cholesterol in our bodies is insufficient, she's going to need to provide some health outcome data showing that vegans with these lower cases of cholesterol are causing some sort of negative health outcome. She also claims that vegans not eating cholesterol will possess lower counts of vitamin D, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, and DHA, but provides no evidence for any of these markers. Terrific. Number five, vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is only found in animal foods. And if you think your body can convert vitamin K1, which you can get from plants to vitamin K2, think again. First, less than 10% of vitamin K1 is actually absorbed by the body, let alone having enough K1 to convert to K2. Second, a lot of common drugs such as statins, osteoporosis drugs, and blood thinning drugs inhibit that conversion of K1 to K2. That's a problem because not getting enough vitamin K2 increases risk of heart disease. 
Vitamin K2 is also important for improving outcomes in cancer. As a matter of fact, a study of 11,000 people showed that a higher intake of vitamin K2 dropped the risk of advanced prostate cancer by a whopping 62%, whereas vitamin K1 showed no effect. Vitamin K2 is not only found in animal foods. It can be found in natto and sauerkraut. Vitamin K2 has various forms, but the form MK4 and MK7 are most commonly referenced. Natto contains MK7, but does not contain MK4. However, this is not an issue because MK4 can be converted from vitamin K1, which we can find in plants. He also claims that 10% of vitamin K1 is absorbed by the body and provides no source for this claim. What's new? And it has also been shown that humans can produce vitamin K2 in their own microflora to optimal degrees. Number six, vitamin B12. B12 is strictly found in animal foods and a deficiency can sometimes show itself after irreversible nerve damage has occurred. B12 is also crucial for dopamine and serotonin production. This is why it is not surprising that vegetarian diets are associated with an increased risk of depression and anxiety as I outlined in this video. The problem also is that when vegans supplement with B12, they're often using the most common and cheap form of B12 on the market known as cyanocobalamin. For close to half of the population, this form of B12 doesn't work because the body cannot convert it to the biologically active form known as methylfolate. That is because half of the population carries a genetic mutation called the MTHFR mutation, which you can only discover if you run a genetic test from 23andMe. B12 is not strictly found in animal foods. It can also be found in a B12 supplement. He also meant that the body cannot convert cyanocobalamin to its biologically active form of methylcobalamin, not methylfolate. He, of course, did not provide a source for this claim. How many times have I said that now, that she has not provided a source for this claim? Probably like uh, eight times now, right? Somebody count that for me, please. Also, although there isn't strong reason to believe that vegans should be supplementing methylcobalamin over cyanocobalamin, even if there were, there are vegan methylcobalamin supplements. Number seven, vitamin A. That's right. All those carrots and sweet potatoes you thought had vitamin A actually don't. They have a carotenoid, which is a precursor to the biologically active vitamin A. That means your body has to convert, and very inefficiently at that, the carotenoids into vitamin A. The problem is that humans, depending on their genetics, can convert only 0 to 22% of the carotenoids into vitamin A. All right, so I'm just going to be replaying my response to Earth Mama Medicine concerning vitamin A because my response to her is basically the same response I would give to Sarah. So let's just do some math real quick. The recommended daily amount of retinol is around 900 micrograms. Sweet potatoes have a baseline beta carotene to retinol conversion ratio of about 13 to 1. One cup of mashed sweet potato is around 328 grams. The beta carotene content of sweet potatoes have been estimated to be around 55 to 124 micrograms per gram. With this range, let's take an average value of 89.5 micrograms per gram. With this value of beta carotene per gram, one cup of sweet potato contains around 29,000 356 micrograms of beta carotene. When we apply the 13 to 1 conversion rate, we have 2,258 micrograms of retinol from one cup of sweet potato, which is more than double the recommended daily value. Number eight, the omega-3 fats, EPA and DHA. That's right. You don't get the most precious forms of omega-3, EPA and DHA from plant foods. Throw away the chia seeds, the flax seeds, the walnuts. You will save yourself a whole lot of inflammation from their omega-6 fat content and you will make room for some omega-3 rich salmon. All right, so for this part, I will just be playing a portion of Mike the Vegan on omega-3s and DHAs, partially because I wanna save time and because what he says I heavily agree with. DHA is a long chain omega-3 fatty acid that your body can convert from ALA, which is a plant-based source, or you can get DHA from fish who get it from algae. Your body can only convert a limited amount of ALA to DHA, so you need to make sure you're getting enough ALA from plant sources or take an algae-based DHA supplement two to three times a week, as many plant-based doctors suggest. But let's say you don't want to supplement. Let's take a look and see how much ALA from plants you need to eat to make enough DHA. Okay, so you need about 300 milligrams per day. And I can tell you right now, most people are not eating fish every day on an omnivore diet, so they are missing that mark. Conversion rates from ALA vary. On the very low end, it's 2%. The average seems to be about 3.8%. That's an often quoted number. But on the high end, young women have been recorded to convert 9% of ALA to DHA. There is good reason to believe that your conversion rate goes up when you don't eat fish as this study shows, but we can't really put a clear, reliable number on it. So we're just gonna 
Ignore that. One serving or three tablespoons of chia seeds, which would ideally be crushed for absorption, comes out to 5,400 milligrams of ALA. If you're really bad at converting, that's a little over 100 milligrams of DHA that comes out. Average conversion would be about 200 milligrams, and a young woman might convert up to 480 milligrams. So if your average, like, one and a half servings of chia would cover you, I just so happen to have one and a half servings of chia right here. Notice anything at first? It's not a dead fish. And this is really, it's really like a smaller serving of chia pudding if you add some water and that stuff's delicious. Ground flax and walnuts are two other good sources and thankfully vegan products are starting to add DHA like Ripple's pea-based milk. Number nine, vitamin D. Take a vitamin D supplement, crazy. Number 10, protein. Sure, you could design a vegan diet so well as to make sure you are getting all of the essential amino acids in enough amounts every day. What they don't tell you, though, is that it is impossible to achieve that from whole foods without accompanying insanely high amounts of carbohydrate consumption. Have you ever checked to see just how high in carbs soy products and quinoa are? Okay, so she has a problem with carbs, I guess. I mean, if you have a problem with carbs or, you know, high carb high protein vegan foods like legumes or quinoa. You can just have things like tofu, tempeh, and seitan who are lower in carbs compared to these other sources that she's just in huge fear of. Number 11, iron. Because the form of iron in plant foods is very poorly absorbed, it has been reported that vegetarian adults have much lower iron levels as compared to non-vegetarians or omnivores. This increases the risk of iron deficiency anemia, which leads to a slower brain, fatigue, poor immune function, pregnancy complications, and an increased risk of lead poisoning. Vegans who consume a well-balanced diet comprised of whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, dried fruits, fortified cereals, and green leafy vegetables are not going to be at a greater risk of iron deficiency than non-vegans. Of course, if we have a vegan consume low amounts of iron-rich vegan foods, they are going to be more likely to have lower iron levels, but this applies to omnivores too. If someone has an omnivorous diet and doesn't consume that much red meat and doesn't consume that much food overall, they're going to suffer some kind of iron issues. This is not a vegan exclusive issue. Number 12, Anserine. Anserine is a molecule that is similar to carnosine and it is also only found in animal foods. So if you want to prevent premature wrinkles and premature aging, then you need this molecule in your diet. All right, so Anserine is determined by beta alanine status and omnivores taking up a vegetarian diet for six months resulted in no significant change in their beta alanine levels. This suggests that the maintenance of high anserine levels does not depend on nutritional intake of beta alanine and that endogenous beta alanine synthesis can probably entirely compensate for the absence of beta alanine dietary intake. We can conclude from this that vegans do not need to consume anserine because anserine content in vegans can solely depend on beta alanine synthesis occurring in the body. Number 13, zinc. The richest food source of zinc is red meat, so the less red meat you eat, the less optimal your zinc status will be. That's a tragedy given how crucial of a role zinc plays in fighting off bacteria and viruses and healing injuries. It's also concerning that a recent review of 26 studies showed that vegetarian and vegan diets have lower zinc intakes and lower blood levels of zinc compared to meat eaters. So the meta-analysis she cites to support vegans having a higher degree of zinc deficiency compared to non-vegans, oddly enough, is the same study Chris Kresser cited in his debate with Joe Khan and Joe Rogan. For a deep dive into this meta-analysis and how many of the studies didn't actually result in a clear case for vegans being more zinc deficient than non-vegans, I suggest you check out Dr. Abhi's massive video addressing Kresser and Khan's initial debate. I'll put a link to Abhi's video in the description. And if you just go to four hours and 28 minutes and 10 seconds, you will get to the deep dive into the meta-analysis. It is super comprehensive, but worth watching. Alrighty guys, that is the end of the video. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and definitely subscribe to Nutrivore. I believe he also has a video coming out criticizing this exact 13, 13 nutrients video that Sarah has made, and I'm sure he's going to kill it. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.